Thank you for having me here today. I was really excited. Joe's been telling me all about what's been going on in, in Jersey and um, been hearing about it on the, uh, the virtual uh, networks as well. Um, this idea of smart islands and digital transformation for islands really is an exciting one. It sounds to me from what I've heard today that Jersey really has an amazing opportunity to uh, move forward with uh, the whole digitalization topic. And I've entitled my um, presentation Jersey 4.0, and I just wanted to start by talking about Industry 4.0, which originally started in Germany, and Siemens were at the forefront of, of that technology. And I want to talk a little bit about where that really is today. People talk about digital twins, and it's all great stuff but it really is excelling in the industry sector. So I just wanted to start off by telling you a little story about that, and then moving on to how Jersey can really um, embrace this capability. So I was just wondering if anyone knows who this is. Sean will know, I'm sure. Anyone else? The Mars rover, 10 out of 10, well done. <laughs> so um, this was NASA's most comp complicated, complex project that they've ever undertaken. And um, they were to launch the Mars rover in 2012. But of course, with limited cash, well, this was two and a half billion dollars, but with <laughs> limited additional cash, the ability to prototype and to build and rebuild and test the Mars rover was limited. And um, what they did was they, they asked Siemens to support them in this project. And what we did for them is we built the digital twin of the Mars rover. Now, this twin was built before any other building was to take place. So thermal simulations, atmospheric simulations, multi-interactional simulations. This project was completely rel reliant on the Mars rover landing safely. And uh, they had seven minutes from entering Mars atmosphere at 13,000 miles an hour to get it down to zero miles an hour, and as they say, to land the baby safely. Um, so seven minutes that they called the seven minutes of terror. But actually, through multiple simulations, and we didn't just simulate to get it right once, when we got that positive result, we simulate again and again and test and test until we can find the failure point and then we test again. So this um, was a very exciting project that, that we undertook and it was also called the Curiosity Project. We've done a lot of um, training in schools around this, but it um, really is the height of Industry 4.0 where you test everything digitally before you build and before you do anything in the physical world. So. Um, the project itself, you can see lots of little animated characters were developed, huge amount of money spent on that. Um, but actually, if you, if you focus here, um, if you really do use this technology to you know, it, it, its greatest capability, you can reduce the need for physical prototypes by a third, but also accelerate development time by a third as well. So there's lots to be had from this kind of technology. And so Industry 4.0, we've heard about today, but it, it requires all of these capabilities and um, using them to their sort of full extent. The things that really can be achieved are quite incredible. And we talk about the use of robots now in certain environments. And um, you know, people talk as well about the loss of jobs, but actually it really is about shifting jobs. You've know, got to think about the opportunity now that's coming because it's going to come like it or not. So how do we reskill people in the right ways to do different things? 3D printing was mentioned earlier. Of course, um, this really is changing what we can do today, what our capabilities are, and simulating um, test and test again in virtual environments so you don't have to spend huge amounts of money doing this in, in the real world. Um, so the benefits of Industry 4.0, this comes from you know, that industry manufacturing sector, um, they're huge. Increase in productivity, of course, the, the lots of things that we're talking about today, how do we improve productivity in the world today? And digitalization really helps us to do that. 
And also, if you're running um, a business, particularly with hardware components, the, the ability to reduce your operational costs, maintenance costs, is significant. So these are the kind of figures that are coming out today. These are the, the, the sorts of people we're working with, so a lot in aerospace, um, a lot in the automotive sector as well, but also um, sports change like, like um, Adidas. So when you go online and, and you, you put in what color you want, what style you want, um, what we're doing now is mass customization. So the speed at which things come off of the, the conveyor belt in the factory has to remain the same. The productivity levels have to remain the same, if not improve. But every product that comes off the line is different because it's been customized by you at home and the machinery is building its digital twin as it's being produced. So that really is now where we're heading to with um, production uh, facilities, manufacturing facilities. So from 2016, the value of Industry 4.0 in the marketplace, as you can see there, was huge. But actually, only in a few years from now, it's going to more than double from where it was. And um, what I want to talk about is how do we apply that thinking to Jersey and, and where can Jersey really benefit from some of that value and growth? So we've, we've heard a lot about digital twins today and um, taking this thinking from industry and thinking about it in a systematic way. It's a very Siemens word, don't like using it much, but now I've been Siemenized, I, I use it quite a lot. Um, the systematic sort of process of what's involved in, in the digital twin, starting with the create. So if you start in the middle uh, over there on the left, this is about instrumenting your city um, or your island or your system or your port or your airport. Um, get the instruments in, censor it, decide what you want to measure, collect that data. Then you need to be able to communicate um, in real time. Part of that does involve, of course, the edge processing. But most importantly, um, I really want to stress the need for edge security today. So many IP-enabled uh, devices today, a lot of what happens in that, that this cyber security space is coming from hacks that happen um, with edge devices. So security, of course, absolutely at the forefront. Aggregate that data, understand it, get it into a repository so you can access it and use it when you want to. Analysis, iterative models, again, try, test, fail, try again, um, and develop the insights. But really important, visualization of those insights is what's quite critical. Because even if you have data sitting in a data lake, unless you visualize that somehow in a way that's meaningful to you, it's still just a load of data, right? It doesn't really mean very much. And then act. So actionable insights really is where we want to get to with the digital twin. And if you think about that at city scale or island scale, what does that really mean? It might mean improving your environment. It might mean um, speeding up your traffic, lowering your carbon emissions. Whatever those big headline topics are, you can begin to pull those data points, those KPIs, into the digital twin. So uh, we have a partnership with Bentley Systems. We actually have taken a share in Bentley Systems, and if you're in the engineering architectural world, you will know that they are sort of genius behind MicroStation, which is the BIM modeling tools. So um, Bentley Systems modeling tools have been used in major infrastructure projects like Crossrail. It's a, a design tool. So um, we realize the potential in a, as a partnership in developing digital twins. And um, so we've invested significantly a major project over the next two years to begin to do this. And you can see there from the pictures below, literally you can take pictures and begin to, to simulate on the digital twin. You can start taking mesh, 2D images, extruding those out, putting a mesh over them, doing all kinds of different things with them. This is the, the base, really, of, of the twin. But actually, where we want to go with this and um, what we're testing now is taking those sort of baseline images. Now, you can get them through maps, through flying drones over and taking pictures, through satellite data extruding all of those and begin to map out the city. So it might be that um, you have a new area, like the waterfront area here. And um, as you're developing it, you want to understand, you know, how will new buildings in these locations begin to impact traffic or begin to impact wind tunnels or whatever it might be. And because we're doing this with Bentley, we can now take our digital twin, we can then drop in BIM models 
test all those different scenarios, see what's happening um, in the local environment as a result of those adaptations. So we can put in all kinds of GIS information. Um, we can put in um, any other kind of sensor data. So if you want to see here what the carbon emissions are for these buildings, we can plug in that data. We can pull IoT data into this model um, and begin to visualize some of those things. So we can provide heat maps of where the people are coming in the summer, where do they go during the day. You can begin to visualize this as people are moving through um, St. Helier, for instance, if, if they're here. Where, where do people want to go and how do we target those people and how do we accommodate them sufficiently? So um, this was a project already undertaken. It's Helsinki. So Helsinki have a digital twin of the city, and they're about to refresh that and update it. They've got some pretty amazing plans there. But this was, sort of, if you like, the baseline digital twin. So here, this is like, um, if you're an architect, like a big SketchUp model where you can see the form and the shape. You can see the green spaces and the roads. And just even at this level, you can begin to identify some key opportunities, some key challenges. But you begin to overlay what's going on. So for instance, in Helsinki, they wanted to understand how is the city impacted with sea level rises. So you can simulate sea levels coming up and where does the water flow throughout the city? Which areas of the city are at greatest risk? So all these kind of things. And it's really about, you know, not just data and models for data's sake. It's really about having this so you can begin to optimize your strategies, your plans, whether that's economic, environmental, whatever it might be. Get the model there, but begin to think about how can we get the data to inform the model? What do we want to test and try with this model? So this is now a more visual version of, of the uh, model where you can look at it and you can begin to identify some of those buildings there, what they are. Here's a picture of the port um, for our port colleagues. Um, so you can actually see in sort of real terms. And actually, this is very helpful to people who maybe are not so familiar with technology. They don't really understand technical models. Um, and it's not everyone uh, that does understand tech that does need to interact with this kind of stuff because these models can be used for all kinds of operational management activities. And some people just want to be able to have something there they can see and point to and uh, explain their, their stories around. So from that digital base, we can create all kinds of different images and styles of, of these models and uh, begin to simulate different environments that we want to test. Um, so this is, again, it's Helsinki, and it shows you the different kinds of things, that different views and images we can create. Um, they did actually fly drones over the city as well, so you can see it's not so clear as it's coming through on the screen, but that's almost like, you imagine, sort of a Google Earth image um, taken from drones, so they can begin to see what's going on. And um, here was uh, taking images of rooftops and seeing which would be suitable for um, solar penetration for things like rooftop technologies. Uh, they're also mapping out things like uh, escape routes from uh, buildings and exits and so on to ensure pedestrian flow keeps moving. So um, I, I suppose the message here is there's lots of things you can do with the digital twin. Don't necessarily think of it as just one thing or just a collection of data. It can be a really helpful visual tool, and you can use it in all kinds of different ways. We had um, colleagues, actually, one of the, um, I suppose, most common topics that we hear from cities is that the struggle to collect all their commercial taxes. So we had a colleague in Chile who said, you know, the city wants us to do some traffic stuff over here, but actually their biggest problem is how do they collect commercial taxes to pay for all this infrastructure that we'll then be delivering. So we were asked to come up with um, a sort of suggestion as to how they might do that. And um, we thought what might be quite useful for, for this team, because they're essentially were planners, city planners we were dealing with, if they could begin to map and visualize the city, well, first of all, they had a really good view. So you can tell if a building is going to be, largely, you can tell if a building is going to be an office or a garage or, or a, a shop or a, a residential premises. So you get sort of a, a first view of what's going on in the, sec in the city. Second of all, you can begin to map in data that we do have, like energy consumption data, 
um, how many people are connecting to devices during the day, that, that kind of IoT data. You can begin to map in here. You can see which buildings are lighting up red and say, well, actually, if people are using a lot of energy during the day and they're on their phones during the day, that's likely to be a commercial premises. Are we collecting taxes from these guys? So um, if not, let, let's go and do a proper uh, check on what's going on. So, you know, whatever problem you have, if you can begin to visualize it and think about its application in a twin, then um, there's probably some way of dealing with that problem, or at least helping you to. So I thought what I'd do is just look at, at Jer Jersey's um, economy, and we've taken this as the 2016 baseline as uh, we looked at the market figures before, just to see where are the big industries. Of course, we know the obvious one um, over there on the, the right-hand side. Um, but where else is, is money being generated in the economy, and where can Jersey begin to, to optimize some of these uh, capabilities? So financial services, public administration, construction, and so on, some of the bigger chunks. Uh, we thought about having a look to see what, what's going on. Well, already there's applications in banking for um, Industry 4.0. Um, the interesting one, the second one, onboarding, which talks about using federated identity or federated data. And this is quite an interesting one, which um, some people shudder to think about this, but it's actually using um, your sort of ID checks through um, your banking details to allow you to access other services. And actually in Canada, this has been hugely popular. So the government has already made 80 municipal services available online through using um, people's banking IDs. And so this is really about limiting the inconvenience for the, the consumer, optimizing the processes for the, the public authorities. Various other examples there. But it can, in, in public service, really speed up some of those sort of back office duties where those processes tick boxes, yes, no, yes, no, it can come to conclusions very quickly. And it can do that 24 hours a day the industry application of assessing um, paperwork and administration. The use of chatbots now is um, becoming quite a significant, where you can actually have a chatbot that's like a human voice, so you can talk to them. So some of the more simple um, municipal issues that, that departments have to deal with, then there, there are ways of improving uh, processes and operations that way. But um, I'm not going to read out all of these for you, but um, multiple ways in which um, Industry 4.0 really is affecting and improving uh, public service provision. Um, <clears throat> so again, some of the benefits there. Um, cities see this really as a, a helpful way to engage with citizens, but not just people that live in the area, also visitors to the area or um, businesses all kinds of different um, important bodies uh, working with their stakeholder groups and using these kind of capabilities. In construction, again, um, this is another uh, sector that's fairly active in Jersey according to the economic figures. And um, what we're seeing here, I've just picked out three topics particularly, computational design. So now we can see um, machines beginning to develop designs on our behalf using rules, using maps, uh, beginning to develop really complex structures that can take significant amounts of time um, when they're done manually. Putting information into systems to develop machine learning capabilities, really again to speed up the process. Of course, construction is really slow and quite manual still. Um, it's the least digitized sector in the UK. Um, so it's going through a huge transformation at the moment. We're beginning to see some really disruptive business models coming through in construction. And it's certainly worth thinking about if you're involved in that industry. Robotics, and this is really about how do we bring robots in to do some of those manual jobs that um, previously have been done on site. And, and really some you know, quite simple jobs. And, and these things, um, Improving productivity, but it's also about health and safety. So if you can get machines to do some of these jobs, actually health and safety figures on site will, will uh, improve as well. So yeah, again, I, I won't read all of those, but everything down now to image processing, to the condition of concrete, everything that was done manually before, um, machines can come in now, help us do all of this. So energy systems, electrification, um, hugely important. Now we're all moving to this electro-mobility future. Um, 
the energy systems themselves have been beginning to change for a few years, but this move now with vehicles becoming electrified is going to put huge pressure on our energy networks. And so what we're seeing is a lot of decentralization, so local generation, local management of energy systems. But all of that needs communication, how we can provide um, dynamic tariffs for time of day pricing, so you know when's the best time to charge your car, how you can shave peak loads off the energy network, how you can have home uh, grid to, to car charging and, and sharing of energy. So if, if the grid is at its peak and you're at home and you want to put on the TV and the kettle and everything else, can you then take that energy back from the car that you've just charged up a little bit earlier? These are the kind of technologies we're looking at today. And this is definitely something that Jersey should be thinking about in terms of its digital future, how you can really optimize the, the potential of the energy sector. And so what it will help us do is really forecast when are we going to get our renewable energy? How is the weather going to affect that? Can we begin to visualize performance? Uh, can we predict any upcoming failures? We do this quite a lot now with our offshore wind turbines. 99% of all alarms are dealt with onshore. 85% uh, of those are dealt with onshore remotely. What that means for us is we don't have to turn down the entire wind farm as an engineer goes out in really dangerous conditions, goes to the top of the turbine, tries to fix it. We can do that all onshore. So we're keeping the uptime, we're reducing the health and safety uh, impacts for, for those particular individuals. And obviously the customers are able to generate their energy and make their money and so on. Um, but also we can begin to stimulate how people work and, and how they operate. So if they can share energy or save it or generate it and sell it, peer-to-peer -peer energy trading, it's all possible now with digitalization. So if you have a think about you know, your island and, and St. Helier and everything around it, what would it look like to you if it was connected? Could you really create that virtual image of what's going on and what would you want that to look like? What information should it be tracking and telling you? And then how do you get the dashboards up telling you what that information is, how much energy you're using or generating? What are those other KPIs you'd want to know and understand? And then how would you connect everything together, your systems, your services, your management, your processes? This can all be done today. So I just wanted to um, leave you with that thought. And uh, thank you very much for listening to me. That's me. Thank you. <laughs>